WDET is supported by the College of Business Administration at University of Detroit Mercy. UDM's Master of Business Administration is designed to accommodate the career needs of professionals across a variety of work organizations. More information at business.udmercy.edu. It's the Metro on 1019 WDET FM. I'm Tia Graham. And I'm Nick Austin. Today on the program, the Detroit Free Press recently re- released its top new restaurants of the year. We'll hear about the selections with the paper's restaurant and dining critic, Lindsey Green. But first on the Metro, a local nonprofit has new leadership, and its newest leader is a native Detroiter. Maureen Stapleton is the new interim executive director of Midtown Detroit, Inc., and she has the goal of maintaining community and economic development in the Midtown, Cass Corridor, and New Center areas. For example, New Center Park activities. We've actually had the opportunity to host a few events there at New Center Park. Sounds like Detroit concert we had last summer. And since the 1980s, Midtown Detroit, Inc. has aimed to engage the community its leaders, and its visitors to the city of Detroit. To talk more about the plans to develop Midtown, we have Maureen Stapleton here with us. Thank you so much for joining the uh, the show. Thank you for having me. And like I said, I always start off, you're a native Detroiter. What part? Uh, Northwest Detroit, Illinois and Seven Mile area. Born and raised. West side. I got to make sure I get some more east siders on the show. But right now, west side's the best side. So we're just going to keep that going. But, you know, so why is it so important that you as a native Detroiter are in this particular leadership position? Placemaking started in Midtown. Bringing people to the core of the city, to our cultural institutions, is what has been the linchpin. We have one of the finest universities in the country in Midtown. And so what makes it important is it's the base from which all of the placemaking has happened in the city. If we didn't have Midtown, we wouldn't have Eastern Market, Corktown, Live 6, Livernois Avenue of Fashion. And so it's important to ensure that this next generation of planning and inclusion of all people in this area continues. Yeah, so for the people who don't know much about Midtown Inc. or some of the things that you all do, we talked a little bit about it just now with the uh, new Center Park, but what are some of the things that you all do actually throughout the city, some of the uh, um, events that you all are hosting? Um, the one that is the anchor institution or the event that we do every year is Noel Night. Yeah. Uh, D-Electricity was out of Midtown. Mm-hmm. And then there are a host of shopping events, including um, Small Business Saturday, that we participate in annually. And which are huge events, once again, right here in this area. A lot of people look forward to those events every single year. And and once again, it, you know, Midtown Detroit, Inc., it was a collaborative effort that came together in the 80s. And when I think about the 80s, I think about my parents talking about this area, Cass Corridor, through the 80s, through the 90s, into the 2000s, and, and, and its reputation. So, you know, talking about it from then to now, what, where are we from then to now? Uh, we are where developers want to develop. People want to live again and people want to work and play uh, in in the, a culturally rich part of our city. And so um, but for the focused effort of Midtown Detroit, Inc., its uh, first CEO and only leader, Sue Mosey, uh, this would not have happened. Uh, there was a joint effort between the New Center Council and the University Cultural Center Association to join forces make seven neighborhoods the linchpin or the connection to people throughout the city of Detroit. That's been almost 30 years, and we're still moving. Still moving, indeed. So one of the things that you said, or or one of the things that you're working uh, towards, this is what I'm going to quote here, as part of your first 60 days on the job, the plan is to engage the community, to develop a community strategic plan, update that, and it's aimed at uniting residents, anchoring institutions, cultural entities, developers, and and, and a thriving small business community, all bringing them together to, 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 to come to this goal. So who are some of these cultural institutions, cultural entities, and small businesses that you all are coming together with? That will be everyone from the DIA, Mm. the Charles Wright Museum, the Historical Museum. Those are our cultural institutions. That will be everybody who you come down and you buy books from Source Bookseller or you go to Flo's uh, to to buy something for your clothing attire. So we're going to or you go to City Bird Mm. and you buy uh, things that represent Detroit. We are going to make sure that this next area of planning that we do includes everybody. That's not just our cultural institutions. That's not just our small businesses, but that's our residents, 
who live and play in Midtown. That's our university, our anchor institutions like Henry Ford and Wayne State. And all voices uh, will be able to kind of make the plan for the next generation. And I lo- that's the perfect segue into my next question, because when I read that and I read what you're saying, and I instantly think about, number one, you're a native Detroiter, you're a black Detroiter. There's a woman of color who has a seat at the table. So how do you plan on bringing others surrounding you to those seats at those tables? That is probably the number one reason why I came home. Uh, Midtown has done a fabulous job of supporting women-owned, BIPOC-owned businesses. We don't tell the story. We just go on about bringing them here and making them work. I want to tell the story of how Midtown has been a place where African-Americans, women, and others of other ethnicities have come and are thriving here in this community. So part of it's telling the story differently. But also part of it is bringing the next generation of young business owners to plant roots here, get support here, and stay here uh, so that we can all enjoy whatever they, they, they bring to our community. You know, I love that so much. Maureen Stapleton is the new interim executive director of Midtown Detroit, Inc. Just chatting a little bit about some of the things that you all want to do in your role as we continue to go forward, especially in Midtown, New Center and all the connecting uh, uh, communities around that and how they're just kind of bleeding in together and all coming together, like I said, in the city of Detroit and that spirit of Detroit. But when we're talking about what's going on now, who is Maureen Stapleton? She is a lifelong Detroiter. Uh, she's left uh, several times and she comes back. <laughs> she was born in, uh, born on the west side of the city of Detroit and raised on the uh, northwest side. Uh, she went to Howard University and came home. Nice. She went to Bowling Green State University and got a, uh, a master's. She did coursework at Wayne State. She's a 20-some year veteran of public service and nonprofit management uh, with deep community development, government, organizational, operational administration experience. Um, I began my career here in the city of Detroit, and I am absolutely um, ecstatic to be home. And when I hear that, once again, I think about a lot of young people who do uh, leave and come back and leave and come back or maybe even feel bad about leaving. What would you tell young Detroiters, especially right now, where there's a push to keep us here? But maybe some of us, you know, may have another opportunity or somewhere else. What would you tell Detroiters about, you know, leaving but coming back? Don't feel bad about leaving and getting experience, but Mm -hmm. always leave with the understanding that you will someday be back here and bring the expertise, the knowledge, and the understanding that you have from other places back here to allow Detroit to continue to thrive and grow. And one of my last questions to you, I have a few, one of my last questions to you is, is, is how do you plan to implement everything you've learned with your 20 years of experience working in government, working in nonprofit, working in corporate corporations? What do you plan to, or how do you plan to bring your experience here? Well, um, I think that each job I've had has prepared me to work with some segment of this community. Uh, to make it stronger, be that social and human services that need to engage with us. We're community and economic development. We don't do do social services, but without them, we won't have a strong midtown. And so I think what my my background has done is given me an opportunity to have enough connections to the various entities and stakeholders here in Detroit to instantly engage, to tell the story about what we do here in midtown to advance the quality of life and businesses and cultural institutions here. Now, now Maureen, this is truly my last question. You know, the name Cass Corridor versus Midtown. I often hear that, that this is Cass Corridor, this is not Midtown. Where where do you stand with that, the the naming? They're not the same thing. Midtown is seven neighborhoods, Mm. as north as the Boulevard and as south as almost the LCA Arena. Um, One neighborhood is South Cass that we, we used to know as Cass Corridor. And there is an interesting dynamic. The young folks want it to be Cass Corridor. Yeah. The old folks who have some sort of misconception of what it was back in the day don't want that name. And so we will go with those who are living, working, and playing in South Cass or Cass Corridor to determine what we move forward with (laughs) as a name. That's what you guys are hearing right now. So if you live in that area, let us know what you want. You want it to be Cass Corridor or Midtown? Just let us know. But Maureen Stapleton is the new interim executive director of Midtown Detroit, Inc. Maureen, thank you so much for joining us on the Metro. Thank you, Tia. I really, really appreciate it.
Coming up, we'll talk about the latest with our Curiosity Reporting Project here at WDET, including how you can get your questions answered about the region as the Metro continues on 1019 WDET. Welcome back. This is the Metro. I'm Tia Graham. Of course, Nick Austin is going to bring you a really cool conversation about pop. I love that. But we're going to take a quick look at the weather forecast. Today will be partly sunny with a high around 51 degrees. Tomorrow, Friday, there might be a chance of rain after 4 p.m. Then expect a high around 55 degrees. Saturday, more rain is expected. Winds could reach up to 24 miles per hour. Could see a mix of rain and snow with a high around 54 degrees right now at WDET. It is 46 degrees. That's right. And, uh, you know, that might be one question that you had. What is the temperature right now in Detroit? But another thing that we know is that you have questions about Detroit out there listening, and we have answers. It's one of the reasons why at WDET we started our Curiosity series. Over the years, we've answered many questions about directly what you want to hear uh, directly from listeners like you. Questions about the region, ranging from the story behind Detroit's Mile Roads and the background of Superman ice cream to why we have five gross points and what happened to Detroit's swimmobiles. Well, this year, veteran WDET host and anchor Amanda LeClaire is taking over the duties running our Curiosity podcast and helping us answer your questions about the city and our region. To learn more about her plans, including a look at the next question we're answering and how you can get involved, we're joined by Amanda LeClaire. Amanda, hey welcome guys. to the Metro. Hi, Amanda. Hi. I, I love you so much. That's all. Oh, I love you too, Tia. <laughs> It's so good to be back on the air with you. So, yeah, this is the new thing that I'm doing here at the station is uh, anchoring, of course, and I'm going to be heading up the Curiosity podcast. I'm really excited to do that. Our uh, Laura Herberg was doing an amazing job with it. Uh, she's left us for Outlier. We miss her. So I am picking up uh, on Curiosity and super excited for this new project. All right. Well, if you're going to be at the helm, I'm sure you have visions of what you're going to do uh, with Curiosity. So what are your plans? Well, I want to get weird. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and when I'm looking at the listener questions, I want you guys to let us know your, your whatever question you have about Detroit, your weirdest questions out there. It does not have to be about infrastructure or roads. We've done a lot of those, and those are great. We found out how, what Outer Drive. We drove all of Outer Drive. Yeah, that was cool. Thing. Great story. Uh, but yeah, let us know your questions. WDET.org slash curiosity is where to go. But the next curiosity is going to be a big one, you guys. And that is a question from Ashley in Canton. She asked us, is it true that Verner's <laughs> will cure all ailments? I can answer that right now. No. Oh, yeah? Yes. <laughs> oh, then we're done. I guess we're I guess the that's the question. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks For a me? lot, man. For me? Yeah. <sighs> See, I'm, I'm, I'm going to discover if it does. And mostly important about this question I really love is that Verner's has been a part of not just Detroit, but the community here, families here in the city for decades and decades. It is something that people do go to when they're not feeling well. Verner's wasn't part of my family history in, in particular, but it was a part of so many people's, like including a lot of my colleagues and coworkers. It's so real, Amanda. My best friend lives in Atlanta now, and she makes sure that she gets cases of Verner's before she goes back. Yeah. Oh, she gets Verner's here, and then she takes it back yeah, to Atlanta? Yeah, and sometimes wow. she'll find it in Atlanta, but usually she has to, like, get it here. Oh, yeah, that's a special trip. Yeah. yeah. Well, as you mentioned, Amanda, you did. I saw you with a microphone. You went around, asked a bunch of our colleagues here at WDET. We're going to hear what you learned. The first voice you'll hear on this clip is our own Amanda LeClaire. Did your family have a soda or a pop that they gave you when you were sick? Maybe one that that cured all illnesses. Verner's. Straight out of the glass? Yes, of course. Verner's. Okay. How would you guys drink Verner's? Um, Actually, it was two ways. The cold way, but when we were ill, it was warmed. Warm Verner's. So how would you guys warm it up? That's a good question. I think we left it out room temperature. It would be Verner's warmed up in a coffee mug in the microwave. Warmed up Verner's in a mu- in the microwave. Yeah. I don't know that it healed me, but it was good. Um, Verner's ginger ale. How'd you guys drink it when you were sick? Warm. In a cup that was warmed up. 
like on the stove yes. when it was mm-hmm. warmed up. Mm-hmm. Was it bubbly still? Not as bubbly, but it was still bubbly. Did it work? I don't think so. <laughs> Yeah, I think I'm in line with that last voice there, Amanda. (laughs) But one of the things I noticed in listening to the folks that you interviewed here at the station about that, any fizzy drink that you guys used in your family as kind of a cure-all that came through what we might call an old wives' tale, if you will, or one of those home remedies, Mm. the idea was that everybody said Verner's. You didn't really hear a lot of other options there, man. Not a lot. I guess I was a little bit surprised by that, but I shouldn't have been. So what were the reason I am on the Metro today, though, I want to get this out there, is I want to ask you, did you use Verner's when you were sick, when you were little? Was that a family tradition or was it a different soda? Or I should say pop. We are in Detroit. 313-577-3414. That is the number to leave us a voicemail. I'm going to use these stories in the uh, next episode of Curiosity. So that's what we want to know. Did your family have a tradition of using Verner's or maybe a different soda uh, when you were sick? And did it help? That's going to be the question. Yeah. I now am on you to do all the scientific research that is necessary and trial studies to make sure we get an accurate answer to this question. I am a scientist. (laughs) All right. Well, you know what? We'll have to have you back on to learn more about your scientific prowess. Amanda LeClaire, a reporter, anchor, and curator of our Curiosity series. Thanks for joining us on the Metro. Thank you so much. This is the Metro on 1019 WDET. And as Amanda mentioned, this is our next curiosity question. Did your family have a go-to soda or pop for six days? Was there a specific fizzy drink that they believed to magically whisk away illnesses? We'd love to hear your stories and traditions. Drop Amanda a voicemail at 313-577-3414. It's the Metro. I'm Nick Austin alongside Tia Graham. I was just going to say, I'm surprised you uh, don't uh, have the same experience with Verner's. You mean curing all of yeah. my ailments? Yeah, at least a tummy ache. No. Wow. I, you know, tummy aches have this amazing ability to resolve on their own. So you just sit in pain? You just sit in pain? I mean, I could fake myself into thinking Be that a man. soda pop is no, doing kidding. something about it. <laughs> you know, we did drink a little bit of Sprite, though. Yeah. I will admit that that came into play. But it wasn't specifically Verner's. And I think that was just more because having a sugary beverage makes you feel a little bit better when you're younger. Boom. There's your explanation. That's all we needed, Nick. <laughs> That's all we needed from you. Coming up, though, just like uh, Nick said on the Metro, we'll hear about Nikki Haley supporters and if they're going to go on over to the other side with Trump or if they're going to stay with Someone else, like Joe Biden. Yes. We'll find out more. Why don't we find out about it right now? Because we had an opportunity to learn a little bit more, again, with uh, Haley dropping out of the race. Both Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump are trying to get her vote. So who might Haley support or Haley voters support? NPR's A. Martinez spoke with GOP strategist Alex Conant about the predicament and who Haley voters will throw their weight behind. Those voters in 2016, I'm very familiar with those voters because a lot of those voters, they voted for the guy I supported in 2016, who was Marco Rubio. And in 2016, they ended up going out and voting against Hillary Clinton, voting for Trump. I think that was decisive in that election. But those voters don't like Donald Trump very much. And they sat out in 2018, 2020, which is why Trump lost. And again in 2022, which is why Republicans underperformed. I think if they go out and vote against Joe Biden, if they vote for Trump this fall, Trump's going to win. But if they sit out again or if they don't vote for or 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 vote uh, vote for Trump. Um, that's going to be that, that that that's going to be decisive. So if they don't like Trump, how does Trump persuade them to like him enough to vote for him? You know, I talked to a lot of Nikki Haley voters yesterday, um, and every one of them said that they were planning on sitting out the election right now. And I asked them, well, what could get you to the polls? What could get you to go out and vote Republican or vote for Donald Trump? And it came down to Joe Biden. You know, if they thought that Joe Biden was more dangerous than Donald Trump, they kind of would they they would they would sort of grit their teeth and go out and vote, but but they're not convinced right now. Right now, they they don't like either of the candidates, and they said that they were either planning to write in somebody or or not vote at all. Does Trump need those Haley voters to win? 
Yeah, absolutely. Look, I think this is going to be a very close election. I mean, it's likely to come down to tens of thousands of votes across five or six states. Um, and it, 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 <laughs> it, it's literally true in this case. I think every vote counts. And if you have these soft Republicans, these are Republicans that live in the suburbs, independent voters, um, they're the ones that d- decide uh, presidential races in America. And yeah, Trump absolutely needs them to, to turn out or, or Biden's going to win again. Yeah, well, I guess I guess uh, the, the question is, like, does he need them to vote for him as much as he needs them not to vote for Joe Biden? No is the answer. I, I think a vote against <laughs> Joe Biden, I think a vote against Joe Biden is going to be the same as a vote for Donald Trump. I don't think anybody in America is going out to vote for I don't think I should say anybody, but I don't think a lot of people are going out to vote for their candidate this time around. You look yeah. at these candidates approval ratings. People are going to go vote against Joe Biden or they're going to go vote against Donald Trump. And I expect in the in the State of the Union tonight, I think Joe Biden's going to do everything he can to paint a picture of what America would look like under a Donald Trump presidency, trying to scare his base, trying to scare independent voters. And every time Donald Trump opens up his mouth, he's going to be attacking Joe Biden, making the case for why you got to get out there and vote against Joe Biden. Yeah, that's what it feels like, Alex, that people aren't voting for people as much as they're voting against someone. Um, wondering, though, there's some U.S. Senate races where Trump supporting GOP candidates could court Haley supporters. Uh, Carrie Lake in Arizona has openly said that she is going after Haley voters. Could it work the same way for these down ballot races? Yeah, absolutely. Look, I. Those same Nikki Haley voters that I was talking to yesterday, they they said they don't want to vote in the presidential race, but they definitely want to vote in the down ballot races. They see the importance of the Senate. They see the importance of the House, both of which are going to be up for grabs this fall. So even if they don't want to vote in the presidential race, they're very open to to voting in the Senate races. And so I'm not at all surprised that that somebody like Carrie Lake, who's going to be in a very competitive race in Arizona, is doing everything she can to reach out to Nikki Haley voters. So now that she suspended her campaign, what was the point of Nikki Haley staying in the race as long as she did when all the signs seemed to point that eventually we were going to get exactly where we're at? I think she wanted to make a point that the party isn't as united as Donald Trump says it is, that there are still limited government traditional conservatives in the party. About 30 to 40 percent of the party is still limited government conservatives. And I think she made that point. And now it's the onus is on Trump to, to win those votes if he wants to be elected president again. That was NPR's A. Martinez speaking with GOP strategist Alex Conan. This is the Metro. And coming up, we'll talk about why traffic accidents are so high in Detroit and what we can do to reduce them. Driving around Detroit and the metro area, you may have noticed a scary trend. There are significantly more accidents today than the past few years. In comparison with 2013 numbers in the city, car crashes are up by about 6,000 and pedestrian fatalities are up by about 20. And this week, the Detroit News reported that Detroit Department of Transportation drivers were involved in 369 collisions, one for every day last year. But it's not just here. After decades-long decades declines since the 1940s, motor vehicle-related deaths are up since 2020 across the country. This is very different in other countries, as one New York Times analyst points out. If the U.S. made as much progress reducing vehicle accidents as other rich nations in the past two decades, we would save 25,000 lives each year. So how did we get here? Why are accidents rising? And what can we do to lower them? To discuss this, we have Yona Freemark. He is a principal research associate at the Urban Institute, and he's written about how America can reduce traffic fatalities. Yona, welcome to the Metro. Thank you for having me. Oh, thank you. America drastically reduced its traffic fatalities over the last few decades, despite the recent rise. How did we do this? Well, there are a number of key ways that the U.S. really changed the game on traffic fatalities. The the best explanation is that people started wearing seatbelts and cars started having seatbelts. You know, making sure that people didn't fly out of windshields when they, you know, got into crashes meant that they were able to save their lives. And that was combined with significant improvements in the quality of the structure of vehicles that were imposed by the, the you know, federal regulations related to car design. So why are traffic fatalities up now since we've seen such a decline over decades? So I think there are a few explanations. Uh, one is that, frankly, uh, we have allowed for a lot of speeding and uh, obnoxious driving on streets all across the country. Um, this really started to ramp up during the pandemic, uh, but it's continued in, in the years since. And I, I think 
we, we haven't done a great job enforcing things like speed limits. And this has encouraged people to drive in a, in a way that does cause traffic accidents. The other thing that's worth pointing out is that we've had an enormous expansion in the size of the vehicles on the road. So we've gone from having many smaller cars, you know, sedans, to many more SUVs and trucks. And those SUVs and trucks are much more dangerous when it comes to causing deaths in car accidents. And once again, just uh, continuing and thinking about some of the things, especially as we are hyper focused here in the city of Detroit, we recently just had two accidents just last night uh, involving pedestrians uh, in the road. So, you know, when I hear about that and I think about some of the infrastructure issues that we may have in, in, in America, what are some ways that we can fix infrastructure in order to protect prote- pedestrians as they're uh, walking through the streets? Well, one of the biggest ways we can really improve conditions for pedestrians on our streets is to create environments where pedestrians are prioritized. And so what that means is having spaces reserved only for pedestrians, having uh, high visibility crosswalks, having uh, better enforcement of speed limits on those streets so that drivers who are driving uh, too quickly actually get stopped rather than being allowed to go uh, faster than is what's going on. Now, I, you know, I think we, there's been a move in the United States towards larger and larger vehicles, but I think we have an opportunity to change that, and we need to move away from SUVs and trucks, frankly, if we want to reduce the number of pedestrians getting killed. You know, Yona, it's Nick Austin jumping in here to piggyback off of something you said earlier. You mentioned that there are more larger vehicles, trucks, SUVs out there. However, in looking at the numbers that I've seen, I mean, that's a trend that was going up even in the early aughts, in the 2010s. But we still saw a reduction in mm-hmm. uh, in deaths during that period of time. So can you solely put this on, or how big of a factor would the size of vehicles be here? And if so, what is it about these bigger vehicles that would, that would cause that trend now as opposed to earlier? So the larger vehicles are really most of a concern for pedestrians. There was recent data that, that came out from the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety showing that vehicles with high hoods, like trucks and SUVs, are about 45% more likely to cause a pedestrian death than sedans. And that's because when the hood hits a pedestrian of a truck, it's going to be hitting them in the chest or in the head, whereas with a sedan, it's hitting them in the legs, and they're much more likely to survive that. Now, you are right that uh, there was a downward trend in the years up until about 2019, and that trend has reversed. And my sense is that we have a few different issues going on. One is continued expansion in the number of people with SUVs and trucks. But another is uh, increase in people driving way over the speed limit, uh, which has really been associated with bad outcomes. And the last element, which I think is really important, is lots and lots of people in their cars using mobile devices or the screens in their vehicles at the same time. So all those three trends have happened simultaneously. Yeah. And, you know, I think that goes to enforcement as you're talking about, right? Even here in Michigan, we've recently instituted policy to prevent people from looking at their phones or screens while they're driving. Still, the actual uh, ticket that you get for that or the fine, whether it's 500 bucks or what have you, it's still pretty lower because residents seem to be kind of uh, reduced to it. How do we balance and, and have you seen this in other countries? the desire of folks in their vehicles to drive versus the need for pedestrians to also feel safe while they're on the roads. How do you find that balance there? Yeah, I mean, I think even with the fines in place, unfortunately, you know, it's a it's a policy that's quite hard to enforce. You know, if somebody's playing with their screen in their car or playing with their mobile phone, it's very difficult for a police officer to actually see that that's occurring. And so, you know, it, it's a difficult issue to get over. Now, I I do think that there's an opportunity here to encourage or require automakers to install more devices on their cars that automatically stop the vehicles if they are in a condition where they might be approaching a pedestrian or another vehicle. It is true that there have been some recent changes in technology that that do improve uh, the ability of cars to avoid hitting pedestrians. But from that perspective, uh, you know, the European Union has done a better job at actually requiring more protective devices for for preventing crashes with pedestrians. Hmm. Well, in writing that you had recently discussed France, for example, as well as other developed nations being able to lower them while we're seeing increases in America, what did France do? So France has taken a really aggressive approach to enforcing speed limits, actually. So 
throughout France, there are these automatic speed limit uh, enforcement cameras that essentially will send you a fine immediately if you go over the speed limit, if you pass one of these cameras. And these are located on highways all over the country of France since 2002. And that's been really effective. The other thing that, that France has done is it has had a systematic effort to expand the, the pedestrian spaces in the communities where there are a lot of pedestrians on the street. So you might be thinking places like downtown Ann Arbor, downtown Detroit, where there are lots of pedestrians moving around. And in those spaces, France has made an effort to reduce the space in the roadway that's actually occupied by cars and replace it with pedestrian-only spaces. Mm. You know, I think I do like what you're saying there with that last part about pedestrian only spaces, because if I were to look at it from the perspective of a motorist when you're in a place like a Detroit, which has dense areas, but can be pretty spread out, especially in terms of metro areas. Uh, some motorists might tell you part of the problem is pedestrians, pedestrians walking in places where you're not expecting pedestrians to walk, not at crosswalks, not at designated places. So that's one thing that you did bring up there. But when we see an uptick here, I just want to make sure I put out the the other perspective. Do we see more reckless walking or something like that from pedestrians? I mean, is there any ideas or designs on maybe uh, creating more pedestrian safe walking spaces and maybe disincentivizing trying to cross a six lane highway? So we don't have a huge amount of evidence on whether pedestrians are walking more uh, aggressively or something of that sort. But I do think one thing that is a problem on a lot of sort of suburban roadways where you have, you know, a four to six lane arterial roadway is that the space for pedestrians is very unsafe and the pedestrians themselves don't really know how to be there. And that's why drivers experience that situation in a negative way. What we need are clear sidewalks on all of those roadways throughout our metropolitan areas, but also really clear and well-lit crosswalks so that pedestrians can feel like they can cross the street in a safe manner and drivers know exactly where the pedestrians are going to be. Because I agree, pedestrians crossing randomly in the middle of a major street is a cause of traffic crashes and is not helpful for drivers either. All right. Well, let's look at what it would take to do that then, because this all comes back down to money, right? And we always have a little bit of a hesitancy to pay for these things. You're talking about some changes to physical infrastructure in places that already have infrastructure in place. So for you, I mean, do we know what the cost of that is like? Uh, What recommendations would you have on uh, how to correct physical infrastructure, maybe best bang for your buck or ways other places have done it, to make these improvements to places that already have the infrastructure in place? Well, one thing I would I would point out is that if we collected more automatic fines on driver speeding, we would have more money to spend Mm. on infrastructure. So that's the first thing. But it's also worth saying that Investments like sidewalks and better lit crosswalks are not expensive compared to other sorts of infrastructure that we invest in. You know, a a highway expansion can cost a hundred million dollars a mile to invest in. A sidewalk might only cost about a million dollars or less per mile if you wanted to have a really high quality sidewalk. So from the perspective of making sure that you create conditions that are safe for pedestrians, it's not super expensive. Another thing is that there are grants out there from the federal government that help cover some of those costs. There's a program called Safe Streets for All that local communities throughout the country, including in Michigan, can apply for and actually get the federal government to pay for the costs of improving sidewalks. All right. Yona Freemark, Principal Research Associate at the Urban Institute. Thanks for joining us on the Metro. Thanks for having me. This is The Metro. I'm Tia Graham here with Nick Austin. And coming up, we'll talk about a new show hitting the Detroit Opera House this Friday. You all stay right there.
welcome back to the Metro right here on 1019 WDET FM. I am Tia Graham here with Nick Austin. That's right. And the Detroit Opera House is a significant cultural space in the city, Tia. And starting Friday, your operas three and four, originally composed by John Cage, will be playing in Detroit. In the Groove host, Ryan Patrick Hooper spoke with director Yuval Sharon about how this opera's joyful anarchy resembles Detroit's techno scene. Your operas three and four has been performed very rarely, and they are these wonderful works that essentially weave together a brand new opera from all pre-existing materials. So all of the arias from, come from classical yeah, operas, like all the greatest hits of opera. All of the costumes come from the Detroit Opera uh, warehouse. The props come from Detroit Opera. Uh, two pianos are playing excerpts of famous um, uh, opera uh, scenes. And uh, all of it is happening at the exact same time. So there is a kind of simultaneous chaos, uh, a very joyful anarchy that kind of arises from the weaving together of all of these different voices. In a wonderfully playful way, really invites us to consider is the constituent parts that make up an opera when they are left to run a little bit amok. So as opposed to the kind of conventional opera where everything is organized in a really hierarchical way and everything is coordinated to achieve one effect, there are at any given moment any number of impressions and events that are happening on stage. I like to think of it less as it's an opera without a story. Uh, instead, I like to think of it as having so many different stories. And you as an audience member are invited to just take in all of the many beautiful sounds uh, and sights that emerge over the course of the piece. Well, this is starting to make sense because you describe it on the website as joyful anarchy. Yes, yes. <laughs> which is a phrase that I think really gets at the heart of what this piece is all about. Uh, you know, for the course of the piece, your opera's three uh, is 70 minutes. And after a break, then we do your opera's four, um, which is 30 minutes. And over the course of that time, you really are just invited to be free as a spectator. You, you're not... You're not forced to be in a zone of concentration where you must pay attention to every detail, which sometimes can be really alienating and quite honestly, really suffocating for a lot of audience members. You know, whether, you know, we're just used to experiencing things in a very different way. And this might feel a little bit more like walking through a kind of garden of sights and sounds, you know, where anything might take your take your attention. You might zoom out and just take in the whole sound field that is created by this piece or you might zoom way in and just watch one individual performer and i think that will also be so so wonderful so so it is it is a joyful anarchy and the 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 real beneficiary of this is the audience who is also really free you've all you directed this and you're taking it to the gem theater it's been a while since we've seen theater or opera inside of the gem and you also mentioned that this doesn't get performed a lot. So what was the choice for you to want to bring this to Detroit audiences? Well, I was actually really drawn to the idea that I think that a Detroit audience will really resonate with this super democratically arranged work, you know, that might actually feel really close to Detroit's techno culture with the idea that what John Cage is doing is basically remixing opera in real time with live voices. And, you know, um, I, I, having talked to a few people that are that are really connected to the techno scene in Detroit, you know, I, I really started I started telling them stories about about John Cage. And they just completely resonated with this notion that for, in the case of a DJ, you know, when you take two records and mix them together, it's like, you know, something new emerges from two pre-existing pieces and like the new reality uh, that's created between these two worlds, you know, in, in the crossfade between these worlds is something really original and really speaks to the artistry of the DJ, right? And the right kind of DJs also are the ones that just think of themselves as a vessel for these kind of 
unexpected collisions that happen. That's really what John Cage is doing with this piece. He's just doing it in real time. And what he's not quite doing is trying to uh, set up set up something that's going to work in a way that we expect you know in fact he leaves everything open to chance everything that has been dictated on the stage was was arranged through a chance-based operation which means we're taking ourselves a little bit out of the equation and letting things unfold that was wdet's ryan patrick hooper speaking with yuval sharon the your opera is playing at the detroit opera house friday through sunday this is the metro and coming up we'll hear about who the detroit free press selected for their top 10 restaurants list but first of course taking a quick look at the weather forecast today will be partly sunny with a high near 51 degrees Tomorrow, Friday, TGIF, there might be rain after 4 p.m., but we'll see a high around 55 degrees. Saturday, rain is expected most of the day. Winds could reach up to 25 miles per hour, a high of 54 in your Sunday. Expect a mix of rain and snow, possibly. And it's going to be partly sunny with a high around 41 degrees. Once again, I'm Tia Graham here with Nick Austin, and this is the Metro. It's the Metro on 1019 WDET, your source for the news, arts and culture driving Detroit. I'm Nick Austin. I am Tia Graham. And one of the things that I truly love about being from the city of Detroit is food. There are a lot of good eats in Detroit, and that makes fierce competition to claim a Detroit Free Press Restaurant Award. WDET's Ann DeLisi sat down recently with Free Press restaurant and dining critic Lindsey Green to discuss who the media outlet nominated for the top 10 restaurants in the city and metro area. Well, Lindsay, this is the big one. Well, I suppose a lot of people would think Restaurant of the Year is the big one, but I think naming top 10, 10 top 10 best new restaurants is a, is a pretty daunting task as well. Was this one difficult to do, this whole top 10 list this year? Top 10 was a little bit of a challenge this year. We had a lot of great restaurants open, but you know, it is our 10th anniversary. And so we wanted to find a way to make it really special. And so I did spend a lot of time just trying to think of how we can, you know, make a little bit of a splash and honor everything we've done over the past decade. So a little tricky, but but still definitely (laughs) fun to put together. All right, well, let's get to it. What came in at number 10? All right, so at number 10, we've got Midnight Temple. And what was it about this restaurant that got it into the top 10? So I think the first thing about Midnight Temple is just that it's beautiful. When you Mm -hmm. walk into the space, it really is sort of transformative. You know, you're coming in from Eastern Market, and we know what that feels like. And then you're sort of swept away into what feels like little India, I imagine. (laughs) You know, it's really beautiful, colorful fabrics. Um, The ambiance is just really fun. Um, And then, of course, the food is it's Indian cuisine, and you've got lots of great, powerful spices. You've got dishes that are vegetarian. You've got vegan options. Um, uh, Just just a lot of really flavorful, amazing Indian food. Okay. What about number nine? At number nine, we've got The Secret Bakery. They are in Ferndale. This is our first bakery on the list. So again, just thinking about how we could, you know, do something different for this anniversary. Um, the bakery, it's it's based in Ferndale. It's a really cool, um, there's a really cool angle. Uh, the owner, Maxwell Leonard, he says, this bakery doesn't exist. <laughs> it's kind of like <laughs> a speakeasy bakery, which is really fun. Um, but it definitely does exist. And right. he's got a lot of really amazing, breads and pastries. He also kind of welcomes other um, bakers and small business owners into the space to do kind of pop-ups, which is also, you know, fun and a nice way Mm -hmm. to support the community. All right. What about number eight? At number eight, we've got Shell Shock Tacos in Mm -hmm. Midtown. Very, very nice. Yeah. It it was cool to see a a taco uh, establishment show up on the list. 
Yeah, it's it's I won't tease to others, but um, we've got, a, a you know, a taco presence on this list. Um, but yeah, it's really cool what they're doing. And they're doing it through this sort of very this this Detroit lens. They say that these this is like a Detroit style taco, which is kind of cool. Um, it's a black owned taqueria, which is also fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, they're doing a lot of cool things. It's a it's a takeout model, too, which is a little different for our list, but really great, delicious food. All right. What about number seven? At number seven, we have our chef of the year. Uh, it is Aaron Kozad of Vigilante Kitchen and Bar. They are also in Midtown. All right. Very good. And at number six? At number six, we're in Ann Arbor. The name of the restaurant is Perido. It's kind of a um, restaurant slash cocktail bar. Mm-hmm. And they've got this Vietnamese influence, really fun, cool space. And number five? At number five, we've got another taco joint. It is Tacos Hernandez Food Truck. (laughs) Nice. A food truck made it in there, too. That's awesome. Yeah. What about number four? At number four, we've got La Supreme in the Book Tower. That was Mm -hmm. a big one for us this year. And number three? We've got The Rind there in Mm -hmm. Berkeley. If you're familiar with Monger's Provisions, it is sort of an offshoot of that. And they're serving really great sort of farm-to-table um, food and and it's also a wine bar doing lots of fun things and you can shop there I mean they have yeah. it's a full like half of that place is you can go shopping for some of the best cheeses you can find anywhere and pastas and all the stuff it's really a wonderful um, establishment that they put together over there all yeah. right we're closing in on it Lindsay what about number two at number two we've got Nuri Pocha it is a really fun Korean restaurant in Clausen. Um, what I think is so cool about it is that it's attached to a Korean fried chicken chain. Mm-hmm. So typically we wouldn't recognize chains and we're not, you know, this piece, Nori, is a totally family owned Korean restaurant built from scratch from um, one man and his brother-in-law and his sister. And it's just really cool that they were able to kind of, you know, attach themselves to this chain. All right. The moment we've all been waiting for going through this list, what came in at number one for you? At number one, we've got Kerr. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. It is a restaurant also in Ferndale, um, kind of this new American, California influence, French uh, inspiration um, runs restaurant doing really great things. That was WDET's Ann DeLisi speaking with free press writer Lindsey Green. This is the Metro 1019 WDET. I'm Nick Austin alongside Tia Graham. And Tia, you just heard a bunch of stories for the day. Did anything stick out to you that you're like, mm, that's making me feel tingly, feel food. good here? Of course. Food. Everything about the food. Every single restaurant I want to try, I looked up every one as she listed them out. So I will definitely... Uh, Head over to Shell Shock Tacos, which is right up the way, All and right. then uh, just go on a little tour because Lindsey Green brought that to us, as well as Andalisi. Thank you both. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you learn more about restaurants. Now I don't just have to sit at home and eat my gruel and porridge every day. Got some more options to maybe diversify my palate, yeah. which yeah. is important because uh, I'm not very good at choosing food. It's all chicken breast. I was going to say you're a meal prepper. Broccoli. You're a meal prepper and every that's wrong day with that. until I'm. <laughs> Done. At least your food is prepared for you. <laughs> and I think about all types of things. Number one thing that we didn't talk about, but it is happening this weekend. We're going to talk about it again tomorrow. Daylight Savings yeah. is this weekend in the U.S. On Sunday, clocks will spring forward an hour, giving us a little less sleep. This also means we'll be getting an hour of sunlight in the evening. So, yeah, yeah. 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 Summer is almost here, and we're wanna, uh, we want to get in the groove with things. That's right. And who is here right <laughs> now, earlier than summer, host of In the Groove, Ryan Patrick Hooper. Ryan, what's coming up Mm. on the show at noon? As you know, In the Groove, always in season. Uh, We've got a lot of great music ahead for you today. Talk about a diverse palette, Nick. Mm. Um, We're going to have some Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds. He is back with new material. I definitely think that's the marquee here. And we're going to push some boundaries. Uh, We're going to play some hypnotic brass ensemble which nick i think you really hit me to absolutely back in the day. love it that's one of my favorites so we're gonna find ways to go from jazz to rock to everything in between it's all gonna make sense it's all rhythm 
no algorithm. Oh, I'm in the go. groove coming up. <laughs> That's going to do it for the Metro, March 7th, 2024. You can listen to recent episodes online at WDET.org and make sure to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform. The show is produced by Sam Corey, David Lyons, and Jack Philbrandt. Our technical director is Nate Bender. Music's done by Sam Bobian. Our news director is Jerome Vaughn. And our program director is Adam Fox. The Metro is a WDET production, a listener-supported service of Wayne State University. If you like what you hear and want to support the Metro, consider becoming a member at WDET.org slash donate. Thank you so much for listening. This is WDET-FM, Detroit Public Radio, your connection to news, music, and conversation. WDET is supported by the College of Business Administration at University of Detroit Mercy. UDM is offering a new master's degree in ethical leadership focused on sustainable, ethical, and inclusive problem solving. More information at business.udmercy.edu.